Raida Saron is a lead product designer at Netflix. Raida and her team work in partner contexts with PlayStations and Samsung Smart TVs, where part of the strategy is to attract non-members onto the service. So chances are that she's lured some of you onto Netflix. Today, she will teach us about data-driven design and how to infuse your design work with curiosity, inspiring teams to join in the search for answers. Please welcome Raida Saron. How many times have you seen a product roadmap like this? A list of features that are predefined, solutions looking for problems, hammers looking for nails. At best, a problem may have been identified through some research. A group of people or a person may decide there's a specific solution that can be applied to solve that problem. And that solution ends up on your product roadmap. A designer then draws a picture of that solution. And if your organization is privileged with experimentation capabilities, your solution will be created as an A-B test. Now, an A-B test, for those of you who don't know, is a way to run an experiment with your product to understand what might be the best possible way to solve a problem. So you form a hypothesis about the solution. You select two groups of people, group A that gets solution A, group B gets solution B. Whichever solution improves the metric you're looking to improve, now you know that would be the solution that you should probably productize in your product or service. But A-B testing is not a substitute for curiosity. In fact, it can be detrimental to learning, a tool engineered to prove a point rather than to learn. So consider such a roadmap to be an invitation to reveal underlying problems to turn your product roadmaps from roadmaps of features and solutions to roadmaps of problems. Or better yet, roadmaps of questions. Now, I was trained as a graphic designer, meaning I was in a program created to produce future art and creative directors for advertising. I've always loved having an audience and I thought, Advertising would be great because I would get to use my artistic talents while also getting lots of opportunities to present to different audiences. It took one internship for me to realize advertising was not for me, and I switched to interaction design. But that was when I realized I lost my playbook. Advertising has been around for a while. Its methods are fairly mature and well-documented. And while they've evolved drastically over the years, advertising is all about selling. And no matter what terrifying new examples of advertising we might encounter, it will still be about selling. And that includes a designer selling their design to clients. This was my training. Many years ago in Saudi Arabia, where I grew up and spent most of my life, advertising agencies designed all of the websites and UX wasn't really a thing. Now there are a lot of people doing great UX work in Saudi, but 15 years ago when I was working there, that wasn't really the case. The market was full of flash websites that crashed your browser didn't work on your shiny new smartphone, and were just generally an awful user experience. So I saw an opportunity to start a user-centered design studio. My first business partner at that studio gave me one of the most valuable pieces of advice that I received in my career. He said, easy on the used car salesman voice. Now in the US, there is a trope about used car salesmen using shallow sales tactics 
to sell you something you don't need. My partner's advice made me realize that I was so caught up in selling our solutions that I never really stopped to ask what problems we were solving. I realized my training was getting in the way because I was trained to, to sell and not to question. 15 years later, and I still think about this advice. I'm a naturally enthusiastic person. I'm loud, I like to talk with my hands, and I like to please people. When I present a design, I, deep down inside, I want it to be great. While I'm presenting, I want there to be an odd hush in the room. And when I'm done presenting, I want the room to be awash in oohs and ahs and applause. But when I'm enthusiastically selling, a solution, I'm not really exploring. And the beauty of our space is the freedom to play and explore. And not only does in too much enthusiasm for a solution leave little room for exploration, too much enthusiasm can silence dissent from the very people that can help you form better questions. So now almost every design review that I do, whether it was with a design team or with a team of cross-functional partners, I frame as an invitation to dissent. And I invite you to do the same. Encourage your teams to do the same. To see a roadmap of features and solutions and turn it into a roadmap of problems. Problems that can be solved through a series of questions. Because design is the question, it's not the answer. The answer is your customer's reaction to your solution, to your product. Now this might seem small and iterative, maybe even lacking vision, but questions don't have to be small, they can be big. Using a format popularized by another speaker here, Jake Knapp, a product question can be, how might we improve the conversion rate on our homepage? Now, this is a pretty small question. It can be impactful to your business, but it's a small question. It's limited in scope to the homepage. You're looking to move a specific metric, which is the conversion rate. The solution set that can come out of this problem is limited by the nature of the question. And that's okay. Not every question needs to be big. But they can be big. For example, how might we improve perception of our product in Turkey? This is a really big question. Turkey is a very big and diverse place. Perception can be interpreted in so many different ways. We're not talking about a specific area of the product, or we could be. That's an open question. And more importantly, whose perception are we actually looking to improve? Is there a specific demographic that we're looking to target? And how are we going to measure this perception? So the more that you unpack this question, the more questions you get. And you can do the same with small questions as well. Because questions have a habit of multiplying for the curious. So why does all of this matter? When you're building a house, you know you'll need a roof, electricity, plumbing. If you're me, you might need a cat door. When you're building an internet platform, there is no playbook. TikTok designers don't have a playbook. There was no Ogilvy on designing global social networks. There's no universal principles of the design of logistics platforms. There's no canonical literature for any of this. 
And there certainly is no one process that can be applied to solve every problem. So for us to assume that we have answers to any of this, well, that's a really big assumption. Because how can there be industry-wide best practices when there really isn't one industry that we're in? Is Airbnb a tech company? Is it in the travel industry? Is it tourism? What about Uber? Is Uber in tech or logistics or public transportation or food distribution? The lines are blurry. And so we have to approach our work with curiosity. Now, this can be shocking to designers entering the field. We're an idealistic bunch. We want to shape the world and we want it to be beautiful. But just as there's no one standard of beauty, there are no best practices. There's no one great design aesthetic. Especially when you're designing for people all over the world. And as design leaders, our task is not to instruct new designers entering the field on how they should design or what the best practices might be, because we don't know. Our task is to help designers get curious. So how do we create that culture of curiosity? Well, first of all, explaining your thinking. We've done a lot of that over the past few minutes of this talk. So I'm not gonna get into it now, but an even more important way to help create a culture of curiosity is to be vulnerable. Vulnerability is something that I'm intimately familiar with. It's part of my everyday life. Because every day I come out to someone new, almost every day. And coming out is a kind of a question. The question is, will you accept me? Now, the thing about questions is that you have to be willing to accept the answer, even if the answer is not to your liking. So in design, this means that the design that you really like or a solution that you just totally believe this was going to be the right solution, the winner, if it loses against what you might consider to be a lesser design, you have to be humble about that. You have to accept it. So you have to be willing to accept that you are wrong. And better yet, you have to be willing to share with your team that you were wrong. Demonstrate that vulnerability. Now, an even better approach is be, to be enthusiastic about being wrong. Because you just learned something new, and that's wonderful. I would argue that can be way more valuable than short-term gains or lifts and conversion rates or whatever the metric of the day was that you were trying to move. Because you produce knowledge for your team. And that's something to be excited about. Thank you.